So my name is Paula Cushing. I'm curator of invertebrate zoology here at the museum. And I'm also a co-founder and co-organizer for a women in science group here called Skirts in Science. And Skirts in Science is one of the, the co-organizers for tonight's talk, along with the Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum in Golden, and along with the third uh, co-organizer uh, co is the Denver Museum of Nature and Sciences uh, Space Science Department. So I thank all three of those organizers for bringing our speaker in. I Jean do Wright. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Jean, I met when I was down in Florida in November for the launch of the space, uh, space capsule Orion for that, the Orion launch, along with a group of DMNS volunteers. And we went into the visitor center, into the Atlantis building where the space shuttle Atlantis was. Jean was there with a cart, and if you guys, well, first of all, how many of you heard about this primarily through the Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum? Please raise your hand. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> welcome. How many of you primarily heard about it through Skirts and Science? Raise your hand. Oh dear. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. And then the rest of you are DMNS folks and volunteers. Yay. Raise your hand, please. Great. And all right, terrific. So uh, when I was down at the Atlantis building, um, two of our DMNS Denver Museum volunteers were so excited because Jean was there with a cart, and we do carts all the time. We have carts out in the museum all the time. So. They pulled me aside and said, look, look, they do carts too, and they have show and tell stuff. And, and this woman is incredible. So I stopped and I was chatting with her and listening to Jean talk, and you know, she is a very, talk. very <laughs> reticent woman, as you <laughs> notice. But no, she was full of wonderful stories. She had great stories about her work with NASA, because it turns out that Jean is a master seamstress. She used to be a candy store manager. Mm -hmm. And when she lived in Flint, Michigan, and then she became involved and hired by NASA because she knew how to read blueprints and she was a master seamstress and that's what they needed. They needed a group of people who were master seamstresses who could make this fabric that she's going to talk about tonight as mm -hmm. part of her lecture, mm -hmm. which was the thermal blankets that went on the outside of the space shuttle. So I, I heard uh, Jean's talk and she had her cart with objects out there at NASA and I thought this is incredible. I had no idea, personally I had no idea there was fabric on the outside of the space shuttle as a thermal protective uh, gar you know, per thermal protective material. So I thought it was amazing. I thought it would be a great talk to bring to Denver uh, for our space sciences volunteers, for DMNS volunteers, for Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum. I thought it would be a cool talk. We're taping it tonight, so if uh, people spread the word, if you didn't get a chance, or if your friends didn't get a chance to hear it tonight, just contact me, Paula Cushing, and I can get you a copy of the lecture. And we'll probably also post it somewhere on our website. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Jean Wright, and please help me welcome her. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me get started here. All righty, let me grab my notes here. Here we go. Now, logically, I would start with the Wright brothers since my husband thinks they're related somehow. Um, let me get my glasses on. Now, uh, again, um, I come from a prospect of a lot of seamstresses, and everybody thinks of Betsy Ross when they think of seamstresses that are in history. So I've done some research to find out some important seamstresses, not only with Betsy Ross, but also throughout history, especially in the space program, since that's near and dear to my heart. So again, with anybody who sews, I, I have an obscene amount of fabric at home, and I am a quilter also. But uh, it might be of interest to you, with the Wright Brothers plane, it was made with a fabric called P Pride of the West fabric, and it was started in a company called Slater Cotton Company that was in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And the company started in 19, excuse me, 1898 and made the fabric, oh, okay, made the fabric for the Wright Brothers plane. Now, um, how the connection with women in the sewing with the, uh, with the Wright Brothers plane, William Tate was a lighthouse keeper, and his wife was married to Addie Tate, who was the postmistress of North Carolina. And so when the Wright Brothers needed uh, advice on where they should have the, uh, their plane fly from, they wrote Kitty Hawk, and, and, and uh, Amanda gave the letter from the Wright Brothers to her husband. And so he recommended that with all the high wind they had in Kitty Hawk, that would be an ideal place for them to launch from. And so what I think is kind of neat is they lived with the uh, Tate family while they were doing construction of the Wright Brother plane. Here we go. And this is them actually doing restoration work after the 100-year anniversary. 
But um, what I thought was neat, Wilbur did most of the sewing on the machine, but it was Amanda Tate or Addie Tate sewing machine that they actually used. And I do have a picture in my um, book that I'll show you after the presentation. She ordered it from the Sears catalog in 19, excuse me, 1899, and she only paid $2 for the sewing machine back then, and it's a Singer sewing machine. And so um, both her and Wilbur were doing the final adjustments on the wings of the Wright Brother plane. And again, when they had the uh, restoration work done in 2002, I'll flip through this, they actually used the same techniques that the Wright Brothers did, same fabric too. But one thing I find endearing about the fabric that they used uh, for the uh, wings of the, primarily for the wings on the plane. They also used a material called French sateen. And the story that I was doing my research with, it was very funny because the local ladies would come and watch the plane being built and they couldn't understand how such a beautiful high quality fabric could be used on an on a airplane that they thought would probably never ever fly. And they thought it was a complete waste of that expensive fabric. But um, quite a while after that, they um, used it when they had the uh, fabric was finished with, they gave the scra scraps to Addie, and she had two children that were Eileen and pa Pauline, Irene, excuse me, Irene and Pauline, and so she ended up making dresses for them out of the fabric. And uh, I read an interview uh, when Pauline was 93, she said, my mother taught us how to sew ourselves on that sewing machine, and those were the best dresses that we ever had, and we wore them out completely. <laughs> Let me advance that. Now this photograph that I have right here is a woman called Ida Holgreave, and I thought it was kind of, I don't know, kind of telling in a way, because a lot of times women have made history and maybe not have gotten credit for things. This was a wide, widely spread photograph, and people would always, they could recognize the fabric. This was from the Wright Brothers uh, Wright Sewing Department. She applied to work there in 1910 with the Wright Brothers Sewing Company, and so this uh, photograph circulated for years and nobody knew who it was. So they knew it was an iconic photo, but no one knew who it was. So when the National Aviation Heritage, Heritage Alliance on the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers flight actually um, asked family members who might have worked with the Wright Brothers Company, could anybody identify who it was? So it took 100 years, but they finally figured out exactly who it was, and it was Ida Holgreave. So now we all know who she is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here we go. Here we go. And what I think is kind of, I, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back for a second. What I think is kind of touching about that is she flew, um, uh, she flew for the very first time when she was 88. And, and, and I find that kind of ironic since she had such a big part in history and it was until she was 88 that she had her first flight. Here we go. I'll leave that. And one thing that I wanted to talk about with the Wright brothers and to tie it in a little bit with the shuttle program, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Wright brothers memorial in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, but with every flight that the uh, Wright brothers took, they actually have a plaque in the ground that tells where they landed at. And so we did the exact same thing when the shuttle program ended. With every shuttle that landed, we actually took a 100-pound piece of black granite, and at the shuttle landing strip, we've marked where each shuttle landed for the very last time, and it has their name on it. So I think that's really neat. So for all the ladies out there, and I'm all, I know it's because we, have a, we still have a long way to go, I think, for NASA out there with ladies. So um, I always ask the, late, the younger girls who come to visit Atlantis, can you tell me who is the first woman commander uh, for our, na our shuttle program? And some people know, some people don't. And it was Eileen Collins. She was a pilot first and eventually became our first woman pilot, or sh excuse me, commander for the shuttle program. And so um, when I talk about how the, uh, we marked where each shuttle landed, we had what we, that was called a wheel stop. When the shuttle stopped for the last time, it was called a wheel stop. And it was a competition that all the astronauts had with each other, with the commanders, that they would measure how accurate they were on their landing. It was a, the, the, you know, a, a, quite a distance that they had. And so I always ask the young girls who come to visit, so can you all guess who had the most accurate landing of all the shuttle astronauts? It was Eileen Collins, who of all the astronauts, she had the most accurate landing in our program. Yes, I agree. Yay, I agree. <laughs> Now these I'm gonna to touch a little bit. I'm just gonna quickly go through. We started off with our Mercury spacesuit. 
Then we went to our Gemini spacesuit, and it talks about, on the third bullet, about the Nomex. And so that piece of felt that I was passing it around, that's the same fabric, so to speak, as the Nomex that we used on, that, on the wing, we also used in the spacesuit. Now, this is, this is near and dear to my heart, because I was 13 and a half when we walked on the moon for the first time with Apollo 11. And so we have our project suit. Um, if you're wondering what A7LB stands for, that means it's an Apollo suit. I'll point that out right here, right there. That means it's an Apollo suit, a seventh version of that flight. L meaning made by International Latex Company. This one happens to have a B because um, with B on uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, I don't know if any of you older folks remember the lunar rover that we had, that the astronauts actually drove around on the moon. Well, we had to readjust this. These parts right here had to be moved, and we also had to change that area there so that they could sit down properly inside the lunar rover. One thing I thought was touching, it was the 25th anniversary of man landing on the moon that Neil Armstrong had said, and I quote, it was one of the most photographed spacecrafts in history, speaking about the Apollo suit. Its true beauty was that it worked. Now, when the suit was first made, it was cost $100,000, and in today's terms, it would be $675,000 excuse me, $675,000 to make the suit today. Here we go. Oops, wrong thing. Here we go. Oops. Am I, oh, I'm going backwards. I'm sorry, I'm getting used to this. Okay, here we go. Now there's a lady here, and her name is Hazel, and she's sewing on a sewing machine that we called Big Mo. Again, we use a lot of singers in our sewing. This is Big Mo that she's sewing on, and, and you're probably wondering, it's funny to name sewing machines. Well, that's the one thing that I think is so neat about the tradition that we've kept as NASA seamstresses. We've continued that same tradition. We had probably close to 35 sewing machines upstairs in our building, and we named every single one of them just like they did. In fact, the one I'll specifically talk about tonight, and I'll bring a picture of Lurch up. Lurch was one of our biggest sewing machines, and I'll be talking about him, but we kept up to the tradition too, and we named all of our sewing machines. Oop. Here we go, sorry. That's what it looked like back then when they worked, and you'll notice how it says that the suits had to be sewn within a 64th of an inch tolerant, which was true, that hasn't changed. Our na it's very stringent with the sewing that we do on shuttle. We go down to 100 thousandth in our measurements when we sewed. Uh, we have what we call a plus or minus. We had a stitch line and we couldn't deviate one side or the other. Now when they sewed the Apollo suits, <coughs> If you added up the whole length of a stitch line for an Apollo suit, it would be longer than a football field, and their accuracy could not be more than one side of the stitch line, or they would scrap the suit. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Now, I included this because I thought this was neat. When the astronauts walked on the moon, specifically Neil Armstrong, who was the first one to walk, you'll see right here, here we go. This is a little piece of wood frame from the Wright Brother plane, and that's some of the, uh, the pride of the West fabric. Neil Armstrong, when he walked on the moon for the first time, wanted an homage to the Wright Brothers, and so he took a piece of wood and a piece of fabric from the Wright Brothers plane, plane and had it in his pocket when he walked on the moon. And so that's a certificate to say that that's what he had done. Here we go. There we go. Now you're probably wondering how, there we go, there we go, well let me go back for just a second. It's kind of a funny story, In, uh, International Latex Company was the company that was selected to make the Apollo suits. Now some of you might not recognize what International Latex means, but if you think of latex or rubber back in the 50s, Probably the first thing that to come to mind would be girdles or maybe bras or maybe even diaper covers because that's exactly what International Latex Company first made. So the company wasn't doing very well, so they thought if they got involved in government contract work, then maybe they could start making a little more money. So they competed with two other companies, but eventually um, uh, the, uh, I, the International Latex Company won, so we find it kind of odd that they went from sewing bras and girdles to making Apollo suits. But because the ladies were very accurate with their sewing, 
And as a seamstress, what was always surprising to me on the Apollo suits is even though they had such a long length of stitching to do, if you were new, they allowed you to have pins when you first started, but you had to count them out, and then at the end of your shift, then they would add up if all the pins were there. But as you progressively got more experience, they insisted that you sew with no pins at all. So it was strictly by the skill of your hands. So I can't even imagine sewing a football length full of stitches and not being able to have pins. Now, one funny story that I'd like to say, and I hope you don't think it's, it's um, not tasteful. I asked my sister Joan, and she said she thought it was kind of inappropriate, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Now, when we made our Apollo suits, and I have a, a book that talks about how detailed the measurements were, there was probably close to 125 measurements that they took of the astronauts. We're talking palm length, finger length, all sorts of length, the waist, the usual measurements that they had. But there was a special part that was called the urinary collection device that was on a certain specific part of a man. Um, and so and, uh, when, uh, when they had the sizing for that, the original sizes were small, medium, and large for that. So naturally, when the astronauts were asked to give, what size do you need, they all said, I need large. <laughs> So they've had a few, um, so what it is, is it, it's like an advice that fits up the front and it has to be snug fitting, but they would over exaggerate their size and they kept falling off. <laughs> so, so what they did is, I know. <laughs> So they had a lot of incidences where that they would actually wet themselves because they would lie about what size they needed. <laughs> so they changed it to, to fix their bruised egos. NASA changed the measurements to, for on that chart to large, extra large, and extra, extra large. <laughs> so you would, think, you would think that would be good enough, but it wasn't. Because Mike Collins, who was our command module pilot on Apollo 11, writes in his book, Carrying the Fire, he goes, well, they may say large, extra large, and extra, extra large, but he said, if our astronauts had our way, it would be extra large, immense, and unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. I know. <laughs> now, see, that wasn't too bad. She said she thought it was in poor taste. <laughs> anyway, this lady right here, She's now called the seamstress that saved the space program because um, back in the uh, Skylab days, we launched in the 70s, we actually had a, a, a Saturn rocket that launched, this was kind of our, it was our first space station, but on launch, we had the outside of the rocket that with the vibrations, a key panel fell off the side of the rocket, which in, in turn damaged a whole section of the uh, Skylab. So um, the temperature sensors showed that it got to 120 degrees inside the working area. So four days after the launch, they hired um, Aileen, and so that's her right there, and she's stitching. Now for all my fellow quilters out there, who've ever made a queen size or a king size quilt, wouldn't it be nice to have all those extra helpers to help you pull the fabric through? Um, and and I, I just get smiles because she's the one that's doing all the work and these are all the helpers. <laughs> But um, another claim to fame for her was, I don't know if you remember the movie, it was quite a number of years ago, at least 20 years ago, called The Boy in the Bubble. And it was a boy who um, had an immune deficiency and he couldn't be, live out in regular, uh, the regular world. And it was Aileen was the one that NASA had asked to build the two suits for him. He had his first one made when he was five. And so and as he grew, she made the second one for him. So she really did a lot for the space program, not only for our space program, but also when they talk about spin-offs and how she had worked on the suits for him. And unfortunately, his name was Joseph Vetter. He died when he was 12. Um, he got sick and they had to take him out of the suit and he died from, from being exposed to the germs. So um, here we go, let me pass that on. Sorry, here we go. Now we'll start the shuttle stuff. Now um, I put this in here on, in case some people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I take it for granted because I worked on them all the time and I see them all the time, but I realize people this far away don't get a chance to see. So when I mention the Ohms pod, when I talk about the tight curve and the thick blankets, these, this is the area that those blankets would go in. That white piece of felt that I showed you uh, would go here on the top of the cargo bay door and also this whole area here is all felt that we had on there. 
Now that felt is a special felt. It's a Nomex felt with a silicone coating on it, but it ex it, it, uh, the temperature range for that one can go up to 700 degrees. And when I talk about spin-offs, we actually have a lot of NASCAR work that we did. We used that Nomex felt back in 91. We had Dale Waltrip come to our thermal protection facility and ask, was there anything we could do to help with the heat in their area where they drove at? Plus, they also complained about having blisters on their feet. So what we did is we took a piece of that Nomex felt that I had out front and started wrapping it around the pipes and also towards the back of them. And we took the internal temperature from 120, excuse me, 180 degrees down to 90 degrees just by wrapping it with that felt. And as for the thick blankets that we have, the quilt, the fabric, the blanket out there, we actually cut a piece of class 11, which is a two inch thick blanket, and we glued that to the bottom of the accelerator so they would no longer have blisters on their feet. So whenever I have any NASCAR people that come into our exhibit, that's the first thing I tell them because I always want people to know, you know, the, 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 you know, the common things, that, how they trickle down. So let me move that again. Okay. Now, um, I have that graphic out front where I had it colored blue where you could see where the blankets were. So but this is a better, uh, well, this is, you can, it's bigger and you can see. So where you see this green area right here, this is where we have all the blankets at on the shuttle. We actually have over 2,400 that we made for that. And again, they're not replaced all the time, which is the beauty when we switch to the fabric. Because when you held that tile, you could see how fragile it was. Um, and so let me advance that a little further. There we go. Okay, and let me start this video. Oh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Help. <laughs> there we go. Wait, there we go. There we go. There we go. The orbiter will be the approximate size of a 727 jet airliner. And the entire vehicle, except for leading edges, way, this will be covered like with reusable surface insulation. <laughs> this insulation will be a coated porous material in tile form, consisting of rigidized high purity silica fibers in an amorphous silica binder. Obviously, the number of tiles to be installed over the entire surface of the vehicle, with its varying contours, protrusions, and openings, requires innovations in technology. building block concept developed by the Space Division is a method of tile installation by which less complex areas, which make up 70% of the vehicle surface, are covered with common tiles. These tiles are tailored to thickness after receipt from the subcontractor and are installed in sectorized gross areas. The building block concept allows maximum use of common tiles and lessens the necessity for exact locations which would be required to install tiles of discrete design. Space Division is using a DC-3 airframe to aid in development of tile installation procedures. It serves as a low-cost test article and provides contours which are similar to those that will be encountered on shuttle. After being machined, the tiles will be pre-fitted to the vehicle bond surface to control surface steps and gaps. That's RTB that they're applying. It's room temperature vulcanization. A strain isolator pad, known as the SIP, mm -hmm. is adhesive bonded to the tiles. The SIP is made from a Nomex felt and is used to accommodate the strain caused by the differences in coefficients of expansion of the silica tile and the aluminum vehicle structure. A room temperature curing silicone adhesive is then applied to the surface of the vehicle. The tiles are installed in arrays covering areas up to 35 square feet at one time. The reusable surface insulation, when fully developed, will provide a reliable, cost-effective, lightweight thermal protection system for shuttle, and will help in the realization of this low-cost workhorse space transportation system to be operational by 1980.
Now the reason why I showed that, because one thing when I talk about the tiles when I'm at Atlantis, I hear all the time all the problem that you had with the shuttle tiles falling off. And initially, yes, but I want to backtrack. Um, Robert Beasley was the gentleman they've given credit for. He had a team of other people that worked with him, but he's generally thought of be the father who came up with the tile. Uh, he was a, a materials engineer that initially worked for Corning. And it's, uh, my brother-in-law is an engineer, and I always tease my brother-in-law about how engineers think differently about things. Well, Robert Beasley really felt that. I, um, I could tell he just thought the same way because he, he seemed like he was almost so much passionate. He said, everywhere I look, I see fiber everywhere. When you see candy being made, you see fiber. When you, when he said, when I'm making my coffee in the morning and I have sugar and cream in it, when it dries on the spoon, I can scrape a little bit and I have fiber made. So from the very beginning, in fact, as early as the 60s, he thought of the idea of mixing the uh, ceramic fibers together, and so he is the uh, one that they generally give credit for. He eventually worked for Lockheed and came up with the first version of what we call the LI-900 tile, which is the tile that I brought. That's the first style kind of tile that we made, and that stands for Lockheed Insulation 900, meaning it's nine pound per cubic foot tile. So that's the, the little example I have is the same kind that he initially first made. But what I thought was so funny, while he was developing the tile themselves, he used to take the basic materials, uh, deionized water and some of the sand that we had, and he actually would mix it in a regular uh, washing machine on a spin cycle so that he could get all his fibers mixed together. And then he would make a batch of it and then um, form it into a shape and then bake it in the oven and then would try and cut it from there. But I think what must have been very disappointing, because it was literally probably back in 63 that he had perfected the idea of the tile. And he approached NASA with the idea of using the tile but they said, we're, up, we're happy with the way we have our reentry vehicles. It's ablative type of heat shield. Now, for those who don't know what the word ablative means, that means as you're coming through the atmosphere, it's burning off for the insulation. These tiles are considered like a passive, and they dissipate the heat. So when he approached them with that, he basically was sent on his way because they said, we don't need anything like that now. So when we started talking about having a lightweight, reusable thermal insulation, he came back to NASA again, and this time, finally, after almost probably close to 15, 20 years, they finally decided that they would start going and using his tile. So see, hard work, it pays off. There we go. There we go. That's some, um, that talks about the glass coating that we put the paint on. Coropon is a, the structure that we paint the shuttle skin with. Uh, it helps prevent rust, and um, we have our filler bar, and we've got the stress strain isolation pad that he was talking about. Now, one thing that they don't have is, and I'm going to have some on the table, we actually have where we have these spaces at right here, we have what we call fabric caulk. And so what it is is it's called a gap filler, and we make those by machine and by hand. Uh, the bottom part is kind of unique because the sleeving, if you look at the bottom of the shuttle, you'll see white spaces between the tile. And what that is is it's a special fireproof cording that we have to hand sew on. So one of the questions I get asked often at Atlantis is, well, gee, it's such a technical machine. Why is there so much hand sewing involved? And we did, trust me, we did plenty of hand sewing on the shuttle. When we sew the sleeving on the, on the gap filler itself, we would have to sew an inch do a French knot, sew another inch, and do another French knot all the way down the whole length of the part. Now people say, well, surely you could have found a machine that could do that, but there isn't one. So the reason why we did that is, if, if by chance on reentry, if the sleeving would start to peel away off the part, the, the, part, the, the reason why we had that knot was it to prevent it from peeling off the rest of the way. So quality was always there, practically with a magnifying glass, to make sure that we had that knot every inch. So here we go. Now this is how, how we have, um, let me see if I can show, I don't know if you can see some of the white in here. These are all gap fillers in here. All that white is all fabric gap fillers. We made thousands of those for the shuttle. Okay, let me play this one too. Oops, darn, sorry. There we go. There it, there it comes. Sorry. Here we go.
Columbia, NASA's first orbiter, is fittingly named after the first American vessel to circumnavigate the globe. However, Columbia quickly becomes a daunting challenge for NASA. Its complex makeup had engineers struggling constantly to reduce Columbia's weight and simplify construction. Especially frustrating was keeping the orbiter's ceramic tiles attached to its fuselage. More than 25,000 of them fit together to protect Columbia from the searing 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. We were having a lot of problems with the thermal protection system of the tiles. Uh, the way we were trying to glue them on, they wouldn't, wouldn't stay on. And we had to come up with a way of making sure that they'd stay on. And we had some really great people that worked that, and that's why it took such a long time. I had hoped it was not gonna take that long since uh, John and I were named as a crew, so we had a lot more time to train than what I had, <laughs> we had both initially planned. The requirement was to be able to handle temperatures like 2,500 degrees F that occur on the surface of the, of the TPS, this and that's five my, that's times what your oven is at and That's at the thermal protection facility at Kennedy Space Center. The other problem is weight because after all, this is an airplane, so you can't have a metallic system on it that weighs tons. It has to be extremely lightweight. And in fact, the shuttle tiles are about 90% air, and th that gives the combination of being able to be temperature resistant and yet at the same time, light. Each orbiter has a unique number of protective tiles. Challenger was built with the most, 31,088, while Atlantis has the fewest, a mere 24,000, 177. Over in Palmdale, they had put on their first effort of putting the, the tiles on to protect the aluminum from the heating they were going to get on re-entry. And some of those tiles, when they put them on in the daytime, next morning the tiles were on the hangar floor. And so that was real scary that they would, could lose some tiles while they were on orbit and really have a problem with the heat coming back on re-entry. Columbia had a lot of tiles missing yet, uh, needed quite a bit of work before we could deliver it to the Cape. And uh, we scrounged throughout the city of Lancaster for uh, RTV, which was the, the material we used to glue the tiles on with. More glue did keep the tiles in place. However, water was literally ripping them apart. It turns out in the instant we hit rain, the tiles almost exploded. The tiles fabrication process was modified and the problem overcome. And let me tell you how we settled that. I hear a lot when the problem when you lost all those tiles and you mentioned 31,000, well we made tiles downstairs and our and the bottom floor of our building. There's a couple of things that we did to improve things. You mentioned that the piece of felt, that helped, but we also started painting the back of each tile with a solution called Ludox and a um, and it would actually call, it's a process called densification that would actually absorb a quarter inch into the bottom of the tile and to strengthen the back of it. And we weren't doing that. And you also notice on the earlier video how they just painted the whole wall of the shuttle and started putting tiles on. They actually had a framework and they would install 40 tile at a time. And so when we have the RTV that we glue onto the tile itself, when it sets and we're ready to glue it on, it's called kicking, which means it's cured and it's ready to put on the orbiter. Well, we were finding out we had to, we started to put him on individually, and that worked. That helped out a lot. But um, when he talked about how water was actually making the tiles explode, it, that's a little bit of an over exaggeration. But there is some truth to that. I can take what we call a tile coupon, which is just it looks like a piece of white chalk. It's a two by two by two inch piece of tile material that we call a coupon, and I literally can take that in my hand and pour three cups of water in it, and it will take every single drop of the three cups. So we have to waterproof every single time we'd come home, only with our first space shuttle. Uh, we had over 31,000 tile on her, and every tile had a thermal couple, again, as I mentioned earlier, so we could see the temperature range of the shuttle. And so um, when it came back, we thought the waterproofing solution that we had sprayed on it would, would come uh, last through the 3,000 degree reentry, but the thermal couples told us it burned out at 1,050. And so we knew we had to come up with something fast. So you're going to think it's funny, 
but we literally on our second shuttle flight used probably close to three or four thousand cans of Scotch Guard on the bottom of the shuttle until we could come up with a new method to waterproof. Now what we ended up switching to was, it's an abbreviated call, DMES was the waterproofing solution that we ended up finding out would be successful for us, but um, it's called dimethyletholoxylene. Um, and another thing that we noticed that was happy, hel uh, helping the uh, tile fall off, when NASA was doing investigative work to figure out just why the tile, besides the waterproofing, we found out because the RTV was kicking so fast and curing so fast, and because the men were trying to install too many tile at once, they were spitting into the RTV pots to slow down the kick kicking. So when NASA started going around asking what kind of variations of work was being done, uh, some of them finally admitted that's exactly what they were doing, is spitting into the pot. So they obviously quit doing that. <laughs> okay, let me get back over here. Here we go. Now you're probably wondering what this is. This is called, this is a special fabric. This is called the leading edge of the wing, and those are called reinforced carbon-carbon panels. That's the leading edge of the wing. The wing and the nose are the hottest areas on the shuttle. People think the tiles are the hottest area, but where you see gray on the shuttle, that's the absolute hottest. Um, it's a special fabric made out of rayon and a phenolic resin, and it's a graphite fabric, and it takes three cycles of being burned in a kiln, and it's very complicated. It's hard to describe how it makes, but this is a fabric. And we have 22 panels on each wing, and um, each panel is anywhere from a quarter to a half an inch thick. Here we go. Okay. Now I bring this up, and you're probably wondering what this is, but I had to include this picture. I'm going to start talking about the, the loss of Columbia, because in my presentations, I get a lot of questions about that, and I don't know if you're interested, but I always was. So this is the bottom of Atlantis. This is the leading edge. That gray that you saw, this is all reinforced carbon-carbon. That's the leading edge of the wing. That area on reentry goes to a minimum of 3,100 degrees which is really kind of surprising that a fabric can withstand that, but it can. Now, um, I'm going to show a video next on the, um, the actual launch video of Columbia where you'll see where the external tank foam hit the leading edge of the wing on panel number eight, which is this panel right here. And I stress external tank foam because for some reason, everyone thinks it was a space shuttle tile that brought Columbia down, and it wasn't. And um, we've lost foam on quite a number of flights. The external tank, that was an issue. No matter what we did, we never could fix the problem. And so we don't know why specifically on that day, why it would hit and punch a hole in the wing. So um, I'll show the launch video, but I wanted to show this because when we had the launch video, you'll see where the foam hit the wing and we had no way of really checking the damage. So I thought, what better way when, we, um, when the shuttle was coming home and we started getting sensor readings, and that's how we knew that the shuttle was in trouble, that Columbia was in trouble, because we have, these, this is a wheel well, this is one of the back wheels, this is the left back wheel, uh, and, um, and so this is panel number eight, so the foam actually hit panel number eight. Initially it hit seven and skidded and punched a hole uh, into panel eight, and it may have estimated it was a 16 by 10 inch hole, and it was exactly in that area right there. And again, we're underneath the shuttle. So in this area here, we have all sorts of sensors in the shuttle, um, actually everywhere. Um, and so the sensors kept coming back that some of the information that they were, we were getting just suddenly stopped. And then we heard an alarm go off, and the astronauts heard the alarm. We heard that tire pressure was expanding. So the flame had actually started, or plasma had actually started coming through panel eight and coming into the wheel well and started melting the tire. Um, and so, um, uh, what's surprising, um, the shuttle was going over uh, 1,500 miles an hour, not even 81 seconds into launch. And I'll start the launch video. Here we go. There we go. Oh, there it goes. I 
I don't know if you can see that right here, the foam right there. So where the foam came off, it's hard to see, but right in this area right here, oops, we have three attachment points to the external tank. And it's called the bipod area. And it's from that bipod area that we kept having foam shut off. And that's the area that the foam came off on this flight too. Well, they estimated that the uh, piece of foam was almost 1.7 pounds, about the size of a reef case. And as you can see in the initial film footage, you see the spray, but th th there's a lot of cold fuel in the tank, so at first we thought it maybe was ice that had broken off. Now, this will shock you. They didn't think something as light as foam could break the wing and watch. Here it goes. See? If you picked up a piece of foam, I've, had, I've held external tank foam. It's almost even lighter than a tile. But again, it was how fast it was going. It eventually switched to, in in, they have a little camera inside the wing. Here we go, and you'll see it. So people ask all the time, is, wasn't there a way we could have checked what happened? Well, the cargo bay doors are open and it blocks the view of that area of the wing. Um, and since Columbia, as they always said, she was the workhorse of the fleet, because she was the heaviest, they said that she had in uh, the eulogy for her, Bob Crippen, who flew on the first shuttle flight, said she was a little bottom heavy like most of us get when we get old. And she was one, our, one of our, uh, the oldest shuttle that we had. She couldn't go to the space station. So if we had science missions, we always picked Columbia. She had an internal airlock. Now, if you've ever seen um, the shuttle dock up to a space station or see them do a spacewalk, their airlock where they dock at the space station is in the cargo bay. But with Columbia, it was actually inside of her. So that was another reason why she couldn't dock. She's too big. Structurally, she was too different than the rest of the shuttles. And she couldn't, she couldn't dock at the space station. And so when we talk about the arms, we didn't have any arms on her, the, uh, rem the uh, Canada, Canada arms that we would use out in space. We didn't have the long one that we use now after Columbia. That wasn't even thought of. And we didn't have any arms on there because we knew she wasn't going to the space station. So again, we had no cameras to, um, out in space to check. Plus, uh, which I thought was kind of shocking to me, we have three cameras that we have on launch, hundreds of cameras, but three key ones that give us an idea of what goes on in that area where the uh, external tank attaches to the shuttle. And for some reason that day, one of the key cameras wasn't working that day. We only had two working. So even if we could have gotten that one to work, we might have had a better chance at seeing that one. Here we go, and that's me. <laughs> um, this is me, whenever we had to go inside, um, I, I, I'll talk about that in a second, but um, that's me with my suit on. But again, if I'm not dragging out the point, um, I found it was fascinating with Columbia. She was the only orbiter we had that had a black box. Because she was the first one and they needed to find uh, data, the other subsequent shuttles didn't have black boxes. Only Columbia did, and it weighed a th about 35 pounds. And um, it looked like if you put three boxes of pizza together, it was about that size. Um, what was kind of fascinating to me, uh, there was a, a, a thing called um, Flight, Day, Flight Day 2 object. The Air, Air Force maintains, they track um, space debris. And we have over 4,000 pieces of debris flying around the Earth all the time, spent satellites or other parts of that. And so the day after the launch, which they didn't look at the, that video until almost a month after the tragedy, they actually found a piece of debris trailing behind shuttle for almost 16 orbits around the Earth. And they uh, blew up that piece of debris uh, visually. 
and ac actually could do calculations and figure out by the density of the material, it probably was either the um, T seal, which is the segments between the reinforced carbon carbon panels, or it was a piece of the reinforced carbon carbon, but after two days it had disappeared. And by the time they looked at the, pay, uh, the film, of course, it was way too late for anything like that. Here we go. Now, I've got some somewhat kind of, I thought, very interesting stories. We have uh, a story of these two guys named Carl Vita and Marty Pontecorvo. They were part of the over 25,000 people that after the Columbia went down, there was over 270 organizations and over 25,000 people over the course of three months to help us find the debris from Columbia. And so these guys are driving down the road and their job is people will call and say, I think I have a part of Columbia. So it was their job to go and to see if it truly was. And so they talk about they're driving down the road and um, they're driving down and they look in plain view and they see what they think is a giant cassette. And they joke amongst themselves that it's probably an old Merle Haggard's cassette, even though it was bigger than what they thought. So, uh, any time a piece of debris off Columbia was found, they had special bags that they were supposed to put them in. Well, they had run out of bags that day, so I think this is kind of outrageous. They had Walmart. Walmart that day was giving food to the people who were helping. And so they talk about how they each were given bags of biscuits and fried chicken. And so they were looking for, in their truck for a bag to put what they thought was a cassette inside. And so they dumped out the, what the garbage in the bag and put this inside this greasy old bag, this old what they thought was a country music cassette inside the bag. So two weeks later, they didn't really give it any thought until they were watching TV one day and happened to look up. They saw the cassette and then they saw the video and it turned out to be the last 14 minutes of the astronauts being alive before the actual camera stopped off. So you see them and they're putting on their gloves, they're mocking it up for the camera and they're waving and they're happy. And it was probably close to maybe three minutes after that videotape that they died. So I kind of look at that almost as um, that it was God's way of letting them see their family one last time and they were all happy when they were going. But um, I get asked a lot, how could something that like that make it through the atmosphere. There was a lot of film on the outside that acted as a natural insulation, but also as I asked my engineers, we had, we found a helmet, we found uh, personal effects that came through the atmosphere without any burn marks on it at all. So I said to my engineers, how could that possibly happen? And he reminded me, we have a lot of super cold fuels, of course, on board, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is minus 225. Liquid nitrogen and hydrogen are like minus 400 something. And so we made these special, um, uh, they're, they're big balls, and that we would cover them with that silver fabric that I have out front, and that's called polyimide. And we called those disco balls when we sewed those, because that's what they look like. So they told me that as the shuttle's breaking apart, those, uh, those balls of fuel were super cold, actually ruptured, and for just a few split seconds, when they burst, created a cloud of insulation that some of the parts made it through, which I thought was very surprising. Um, here we go. Um, and uh, another thing that I was going to talk about, let me see, here we go. Well, here, let me, let me change that for a second. Okay. On a comic note, and I know it's hard to make a joke about something as sad as um, Columbia, but um, I was reading a book called ComCheck, and it talks about these people who NASA, when they would call and say, I think I found a piece of the shuttle, these people were calling in Canada, which of course it had no way it happening. But the two funniest stories that I heard about were this lady had called and said, I think I have shuttle fuel on the side of my house. And then so they came to her house and it was bird poop all over her house. So when they asked her how did she think it was um, fuel from the Columbia, she says, well it wasn't there on, uh, they, they, they crashed on Saturday. And she said it wasn't there Saturday so it must have happened when they crashed. And the other story that I thought was kind of funny, this guy calls and says, I think a piece of debris burned a hole through my dock. So they came out to the pier and to check, or the dock to see if it truly was a piece of shuttle that had gone through the dock and burn a hole. 
So what they had found out was the family was having a barbecue grill, a fire pit on the dock, and they had gotten drunk and it had burned and burned a hole through, but they were saying, oh no, we, 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 know, we, we just had to figure it had to have been from the shuttle, but it ended up being a barbecue grill that had burned its way through the dock. <laughs> Okay. Now, um, I'll, I know I've gone on and on about Columbia, but what touches me is, um, I don't know, you all have heard about what happened to Challenger. That was lost on launch back in uh, January of 86. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of where we buried both of the shuttles. Challenger is buried in missile silo in an area 3031 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And I've been out there a number of times and it's kind of desolate and they never point out where it's at, but we know where it's at and it just seems kind of sad that that's, how, how, that's her resting place. So when we had Columbia, we found about 39% of her and um, we actually took well, the remnants so what they did is they took it to a hangar and tried to rebuild it so they could find what the problem was, but brought her down. But after they had found out what had happened to it, they um, actually took it to the VAB. Now, I don't know if any of you have been out to the Cape Canaveral or Kennedy Space Center. The Vehicle Assembly Building is one of the biggest single-story buildings in the world. It's, um, gosh, like 52 stories high, but it's just one story, and it's huge. So that's where we would assemble the Apollo capsules, and it's also where we would stack the shuttle before it rolled out to the pad. So we actually took the rem remnants of Columbia. We have the crew compartment on one wall in, a, in upstairs on the 16th floor, thousands of condolence cards that people from the United States had sent to us, to those of us who worked out there, plus we have what was left of her, which is, like I said, 39% buried up there. So one thing that they decided to do, and I think it's a wonderful idea, for anybody who's into engineering, anything with textiles, they can ask permission from NASA and actually go up to the 16th floor and they can borrow whatever they need to and do research on it. And so we always looked at it, it was the oldest, oldest shuttle that we had, but we wanted her to be a learning legacy from now on because we didn't want it to have the same history that Challenger did. So it is buried on the 16th floor. Here we go. Here we go, let me. That's my building that I work in. That's the thermal protection facility. People always want to know what it looks like. This is what it looked like upstairs for all my fellow seamstresses. It looks a lot like the Apollo days, doesn't it? We had lots of sewing machines. We had Jukies, Janomis, Consos, um, Singers. Um, and again, we named every one of our machines. That's some of the fabrics that we use. This is polyimide right here. This is silver here. That's some of the mesh that you may have seen between the blankets is that. And this is, um, this is a type of a foil that we have there. Um, that's on the second floor of our building. Um, well, one thing I didn't say, that I, I should have said at the beginning, our positions were called aerospace composite tech soft goods, meaning that we worked with fabric. Um, <laughs> Soft goods meaning fabric. No, there's a difference. NASA recognizes there's a difference. Soft goods is fabric. So um, the, with all the hand sewing that we did, the guys would come upstairs and say, look at it, it looks like a quilting bee up here. So their nickname for us was called the Sew Sisters, and that's one of our favorite nicknames. Now Don, my friend here, knows our favorite nickname that we had. The, um, because of the stuff that we worked with, we itched a lot. We had a lot of ceramic, a lot of fiberglass fabric. In fact, I used to joke to my kids when I came home, mom looks like Liberace was in the car with me because the sun would hit the dash and you could see sparkles all over the car from the fibers. Even though we would go in the air locker and it would blow us off, it always stuck. In fact, on my um, photo album, if you hold it a certain way, you'll see the shininess on the fibers on my photo album. But our favorite nickname, and it's kind of naughty, so called the Itch, Stitch, and Bitch Club was our favorite nickname for us. Uh, in fact, someone once told me, if you ever write a book, that is the name you should name your book. So I'm kind of hesitant saying that because we do have some young people in here, but that was our favorite name. <laughs> um, this right here, uh, again, it's a singer, and you're probably wondering, why are you sewing this machine? Because this is Lurch. Lurch is the one, if we had any big quilting to do, this is it. Um, single, single line quilting, there's a difference. I'm gonna show you another machine. This is what Lurch looked like. He was built in 1914, um, and he looked like that. Looked like that. His first job was to sew saddles, so we knew he was a tough machine. He could sew through probably three or four inches of leather, really thick. So this is what Lurch looks like or evolved into. 
That's what lurch looks like now. So again, if we had any stand-up quilting that we had to do or to finish off parts, that's what we did with lurch. Worked very hard. He was built in 1914. We have another singer that would be on the opposite side of this one. That one was built in 1922. Now this is the miracle machine. That blanket, the big one that you saw here, this is the machine that quilts it. It's called a multi-needle sewing machine. That's the blanket coming out. So you don't see the trough of oil that I was speaking about. The WD-40 is here, but on the back of that. Again, it's nine inch long needles here. Two inches up in the machine. Takes about three and a half minutes for it to quilt. And again, it's quartz fabric on the outside, fiberglass against the middle, and a Q-felt in the um, middle, green felt in the middle, fiberglass on the back and it takes about three and a half minutes for it to quilt. That's another view of it. There's the trough where you can see where the oil would be, right there. And there's all our 30 spools of thread. Each one of these spools right here has a plastic line that comes up through here and then will drop down into the sewing machine so that we can thread it. Now I have a funny story to tell. Um, when I first trained, I really wanted to learn how to sew on this sewing machine. You see it on NASA TV, and every time I would look at it, I would say that would be one machine. If I ever worked out there, I'd love to learn how. So after a year of being out there, I finally got um, certified to work on the machine. So it took me an hour to set the tension, and it looked very pretty, very nice and even, and I was so proud of myself. So I called Quality, and I said, well, it's time for you to inspect it. How did I do? And they said, well, Gene, you're going to have to get back up there and do it again. And I said, why? It looks pretty. And they said, that's exactly what we don't want. I said, don't want. And they said, no. Um, when we do our blankets, and let me advance that a little further. Well, hmm. well, I'll leave it there for now. But, and I'm going to go on a little further. We wanted that extra texture on the back. If we had a loose tension that made a lot of loops on the back, when we painted the back of the blanket with the RTV, that gave it enough gripping power. So having a good tension was the worst thing we could have had on that machine. <laughs> Very frustrating. <laughs> so what I'm sewing here, these are some examples of some of the hand sewing that we did. These two parts right here, actually three, are called thermal barriers. And so where we lined the wheel well doors, we have three layers of these. This one in real life would be about four feet long. Um, completely done by hand. And so how we stabilize the fabric when we make these, we have a fancy name called burn-off tape, which is just the way of the government charging, or 3M company charging the government an outrageous amount for scotch tape. We called it burn-off tape, and that's all it was with scotch tape. So this, this has been heat cleaned, and it's been out of the oven, so this one's ready to install. But why we would sew it, after we drape the fabric around this, and we have two spring tubes inside of here, we would heavily tape it to give it enough uh, strength so that we could hand sew through it. If we were to sew it soft like that, it would be almost impossible. So a lot of our parts we wrapped in scotch tape, did our hand sewing, then it got sent down to be heat clean, and of course it would burn off all the tape. So I show you that, because when I talk about thermal barriers, I want you to get an idea of what I'm talking about when I'm right, well, let me do that. This right here, and I have this blanket up front, I talk about how the blankets that we made all went on the upper surfaces, but I lied. <laughs> this is the only soft blanket that we have on the bottom of the orbiter, and it does a very, very important job. This one takes us four and a half, five days because it's sewn completely by hand. And what I mentioned about the three attachment points of the external tank, the very top attachment point would be right in the middle here, right in the middle yeah, there, right in the middle there. Um, and we have a plate of RCC that covers it, otherwise it would burn up on re-entry. So you'll notice the penetration holes, and the one I have out on the table is all black because that one has flown, so the blanket I have out there has been in space. The job of this bl blanket is very important because um, if by chance, and I mentioned earlier, it, when the external tank blows off, that blanket right there protects the tile in that area from cracking. But with the bolts being kicked off, it's the job of this blanket to catch one of those bolts so they don't go through the bottom of the shuttle. So we joke, five day blanket to make, and its job is done in two minutes, but it's a very important blanket. And these would fly probably about three or four times before it would be time to make another one. 
So I'm just, these next um, ones, I'm just showing you examples of the hand sewing. These are called penetration holes here. And so we'll core out the holes there and actually hand sew that sleeving in. And so certain blankets, they're bolted on and not glued on. So where you see the penetration holes, those are either glued onto a plate or they're bolted on in some way. Now this right here, what I mentioned earlier, these are the dome heat shield blankets right here. Right here, we have three. And so this is engine number one, this is engine number two, and engine number three is peeking out over there. Those, uh, those blankets are back on the orbiter for sound suppression with the engines. Um, we, those, those are the blankets that we use lurch for. If we do big quilting, lurch is the one that we're standing doing this. So when we're quilting these blankets, it takes us a day to prepare the serochrome and baste all the fabric together and mark the stitch lines. Um, and we hand sew the sleeving on the inside and outside wall of that. But when we're standing quilting, there's 12 rows this way and 124 going the opposite way on each half. And then we have to hand knot each one and bury them so we don't have any heat catching on to any, any bump in the fabric. So this was the blanket that I mentioned earlier that of all the unique hand sewing that we had on shuttle, it would be this one because that's how we install it. We actually hand sew those blankets onto the back of the shuttle. They're not bolted or screwed on because in this area right here, all the way around, we have tiles that bevel up like this. And on top of that bevel tile, there's a three quarter inch piece of stainless steel and every eighth of an inch there's a little hole punctured in it. So we actually are sewing those blankets on with stainless steel thread and then we lift up the blanket and then it's installed on the shuttle. And you'd be surprised how many times people will ask me, how in the world do you climb up there and put that blanket up there? <laughs> I get asked that often. Again, those will probably only fly about three times before we have to start them all over again. Now this is the example that I, these, these are my hands. Um, and I pointed out right here, where these, uh, this arrow is here, those are all knots there. Not only do we hand finish off every blanket, but where the uh, threads intersect, we have to knot each one before we even wrap that fabric over. So just knotting all the intersections take time, especially if the blanket is big. After we tie the knots, then that's when I'll flip the fabric over and I'll do the sewing part of it. So if the blanket's on the outside of the orbiter, that's how they're done. Um, we have the thrusters that circle. That's a perfect example of that circle that you saw out on the table. These are all thrusters right here, right here. And what they'll do is they'll tweak um, when they go up into space and they're trying to go to orbit, they'll tweak it to make sure it's in the right circular that they need to. And when they're coming back from space, it also tweaks their, their directions as they're coming back home. And this is the Ohm's pod right here. I had to put a picture of that. You can see what a tight curve that is and how it would be almost impossible to put a tile. So we have blankets here, and that just shows the examples. We have more thrusters back here. And that big blanket that I have outside is this blanket right here, and that's where that one would be installed. So that's why I brought a picture. I have a couple pictures where you can see where it would be. Now, you'll see this, we have a patch. The advantage to us having the fabric blankets is not only is it more sturdier than a tile, but instead of taking the blankets off, if it got a tear in it, that's exactly what we would do. We would take a piece of quartz fabric and hand sew it on there like you would fix your jeans, and then we would coat it with a special ceramic paint called C9, and that would stabilize the fabric and the thread and make the blanket sound just like that when we were done with them. And again, you'll see the blankets with the penetrations. And again, in this area, that's a, uh, we have the star tracker system where the astronauts will look at star constellations to see where they're at. And because that's a, me uh, a mechanical system, uh, we want to lift those sectional blankets off if we have to. So all of those blankets with the penetration holes are glued onto a special aluminum plate and then they're screwed onto the shuttle so we can lift that whole section off. Now see, that gives you a perfect example. That's the side angle. This is the star tracker system that they'll look to see where, the star, where they are from the stars. It's kind of like a star GPS. And so you can see really clearly some of the blankets that we have. And there's over 2,400 blankets that we made, or quilts as we call them. The technical name for them is NASA is famous for their acronyms or everything. A Frizzy is the real name of their blankets. It stands for Advanced Flexible Reusable Surface Insulation. We call them FIBS or fibrous insulated blankets. 
But um, I took that picture of the Atlantis exhibit because I told my husband when I developed the picture, I said, money shot, because when I tell everybody about the grid work of the blankets, I never had a good enough picture. But you can clearly see the quilt, quilted blankets there. And that big blanket out front, this is that right there. If it was installed, it's right there. It's right underneath the back where the back thrusters are at. And that's me. <laughs> Now, when I showed you those long, those long parts on the table, those were thermal barriers that I talked about how we taped and hand sewn. That's it right here, all of those. We have three layers of those around each wheel well. And the reason why we have those, I know it's kind of hard to orient. This right here, the front tire on the shuttle is actually on, the, uh, on right here where you can't see it. That's the bracket that holds it on. The doors of the shuttle, right here and one's off there, but you see the hinges there, the doors open up that way. And so the front wheel is where I'm working at in that area up front. Those thermal barriers are all stitched by hand and depending on the length takes us a day a foot to make. So that one you saw on the table would take us four days to do because it was four feet long. Now, um, I hadn't had much of a chance to talk about it, but on my table, you'll see a bright pink thread. Now, in the manufacturing world, anything that's color, be it green, blue, or pink, even fabric, we know it's high temperature. So the thread that we sewed the thermal barriers with, it's called an aluminum borosilicate thread, or AB440. And so the paint that we paint our tiles with, or, uh, bo aluminum borosilicate glass paint, so if I say glass paint or glass thread, you know it's got to be a high temperature thread, and it is. The pink spool that I have out front melts at 3,250 degrees. Now we always want to go over that because, of course, on reentry, this area itself could be exposed to close to 3,000 degrees. So those thermal barriers, we have three around each door, ensures that when we shut those doors, the wheel well doors, we have no movement at all. So as they're coming home, no flame can go up where the doors join with each other. So uh, I'm on a 10 foot high platform there sitting, but eventually I'll be standing and leaning back to get to the back wall. And it would take two of us a minimum of 17 hours to install all three layers around one wheel well. And we had three wheel wells that we had to do the thermal barriers for. Now again, those weren't replaced every time either, but we would take plastic if you can almost imagine, just a little bit thicker than a piece of paper, and we would shove it up where the two jo doors join, and if we had any movement at all, and we wanted no movement at all, if we had any movement, that meant the thermal barriers had to come out and we had to make new ones, because we didn't want any movement of any plastic when we joined where the seams were together. Here we go. Now this is me down here, a little whimsical here. The shuttle stack here, this is the external tank. So this was the tank right here that the foam actually came off on Columbia and hid. So it wasn't a tile. So it was at, for, way further up. So I developed this picture. I'm on the pad. This is Endeavor's last flight. So this would be May of 2011. Um, as the program was winding down, we got to do what they called FOD walk downs, downs which meant foreign object debris. So we would get to inspect. And other, it basically, they let us walk on the pad so we could say goodbye to the shuttles in different ways. So we got to take tours on the pad and we would check for any type of debris that might kick up during launch. So a bunch of my so sisters, we were able to go up on the pad for, the, uh, for Endeavor's last flight. So that's me standing underneath it. That stack is 184 feet tall. And like I said, when I made the picture, I did it in a four by six and you couldn't even see me. So. Um, here we go, let me, let me switch that. These are solid rocket boosters, by the way. This is, um, in the seams right here is how we lost Challenger. Where their segments joined together, that's where we had the burn through on Challenger. Oh, and that's me again. That's inside Discovery. And I, that's, you know, I know it sounds corny, but that's one of my favorite pictures because I have two granddaughters, Alexa, who just turned eight, and my other granddaughter, Raven's nine and a half, and I'm teaching both of them how to sew and to quilt. And so I don't have a degree, and people are surprised when I tell them that. But I tell them that we were craft people and artists, and we really worked very hard. We were very proud of what we did. And there was only 17 of us sew sisters. Now, one of the questions I get asked constantly is, how did you get your job up there? Did NASA post a job listing for seamstresses? And I tell them that's the strange thing is, they don't advertise for the jobs out there. I, um, uh, 
knew we had seamstresses because, of course, with the sewing of Apollo and everything else and the suits and stuff there. And so um, we have in our local paper called Florida Today, um, they have articles about space all the time. And so there happened to be a woman sewing a, a thermal barrier by hand in the paper. And, um, not even knowing me, her name was Pilar Ryan, and I sent her an email and I asked her what the qualifications were. And um, you had to have an associate's degree, and you had to know some blueprint re reading. So I thought, you know what, and I, I, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try. So it's United Space Alliance was the company that I worked for, and so you could only apply on the computer. So I did, and for six months I waited. Now this is my little luck charm. I didn't have it on. My friend Don, who's right here, him and I graduated 42 years ago, and I saw him for the first time since we graduated yesterday. So I was telling him about my, my, my lanyard here. I wanted so badly to work on the space shuttle, or in space in general. So when my twin sister and I were 10, we used to take our crayons, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start again. <laughs> I'm gonna start again. When we were 10, my sister and I used to take crayons and draw patches and send them to Houston and ask, would they consider our designs for whatever mission was coming up? <laughs> and so we would get a polite thanks but no thanks letter, but we would get an autographed picture out of it and that kind of took care of things for a while. So starting with Apollo 7, my sister and I, long before we knew about acid-free paper, we used to cut articles out of the paper, and I have scrapbooks from Apollo 7 on, and they're falling apart, but I still do. So when I applied and I didn't hear anything for the six months, I literally got down on my knees and I said, you know how badly I want to be out there. And in my heart, I felt he said to me, don't worry, in due time, your time will come, just have patience. So I bought this lanyard, and it says, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget, um, to quilt this human to finish divine. And so this was a lanyard I bought, and I stuck it on my, my bedroom mirror, and every day I would look at the lanyard, and every day just wish there's got to be some day that I'll be able to be out there. So after I tweaked my resume, four days later the call came, and it said Kennedy Space Center on the caller ID. And I thought, this is a sick joke. Someone's playing on me because I couldn't believe that it would actually be that. So I had a call, and they asked me, we want you to interview. And so I did. And so a day before my interview, they said, we have three people who are going to interview you at once. And I'm freaking out because I was scared. And, um, but I, I, I got there early. And um, the story I tell, and it's kind of frustrating, um, my husband was in the Navy 24 years, and I was his biggest cheerleader. But the morning I had my interview, um, he says to me, well, Jeannie, don't get your hopes up too high. And I was mad at him when I left. And I looked at him, <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. I was your biggest cheerleader for 24 years, and this is the send-off you're giving me? And he says, but I know how badly you want it. And so I was kind of miffed when I went. So I turned around and I said to him, you wait, I'm driving a clunker right now. When I get this job, and I will get this job, <laughs> I said, I'm buying myself a new car because I live an hour away from Kennedy Space Center. I live in Melbourne, Florida. So I had my two hour long interview and I felt like everything was fine. In those six months that I waited to find out, I got on the computer and studied thermal protection on the off chance that if by some miracle I had an interview, I wouldn't sound stupid. <laughs> and, um, but when I went in there, um, I was there for two hours, asked a zillion questions, but I felt like I was at a cocktail party. I was trying it in my head so I wouldn't get too nervous. And so after my interview, they said, oh, you did really well, and so we've, we've got a kind of a favor to ask of you. And I said, well, okay. And they said, well, how would you like to go out to the thermal protection facility? And I said, really? And so they said, well, let me call Kim. And Kim came, and she said, well, I can't come, but here, I'll have um, Debbie Arsenault. She'll take you out there. Well, Debbie was a tech that started years and years ago. She drove me out to the thermal protection facility, and all the while I'm talking her head off. Surprise. No, talking her head off about how badly I wanted to be out there since I was a little girl. And so she says, you know, I started out here myself 16 years ago, and she gave me a hug when I went in the building and said, I really wish you a lot of luck, and I hope you get it. So I was introduced to all the ladies at the thermal protection facility. And I thought, that's nice. It's a courtesy thing. They don't interview. We don't have a lot of people come out here and interview. So that's them being nice to us. So four days later, uh, when I came home, my phone rang again, and Kennedy Space Center was on the caller ID again. So this time, I'm with my older daughter. And I says to Jen, this is the most important phone call your mom will ever get in her whole life. So they called and said, we decided we picked you. And I said, really? Keep in mind, 
The only reason why there was an opening, there was not an opening at all. Just a few months before, with all the stuff that we work with, I've had issues with itching too, but uh, one of the ladies, her name was Ruby, had asked to be transferred out of the department. Otherwise, there never would have been an opening. I was the very last one they hired for the thermal protection facility in the job that we did. So that, to me, is a miracle right there. So when my boss called and told me that I had gotten the job, um, I, um, he said, we loved you the minute we saw you. We knew you were enthusiastic. You knew everything, because I would watch NASA TV. I was, I was really into everything. And so he said, we wanted somebody with, with passion for the program, and we could see that when we saw you. And I said, well, what about the other girls? And he said, you were the only one we asked to go out. And then he said, kind of frustrated, and it never even occurred to you that when we invited you out to the thermal protection facility that you had been hired that day? And I said, how in the world would I know that? And he said, but you were. And so he said, we want, he said, I'll interview the other ladies, but I want this one. So when it was time to call my husband, one of the ladies at his office answered and said, well, did you get it? And I said, yeah, but don't tell him. So he comes on the phone and he said, well, and I said, well, it's time for us to start looking for a new car. <laughs> so that's how that was. I, I get asked that a lot, but truly, the odds were less than 1%, maybe even zero, that I would even be able to go out there. So I, I put this in because this is inside Discovery, right before she's heading for the Smithsonian. So again, they said, how would you guys like to say goodbye to the shuttles? And they would let us go in them one last time. So I said, can I go in the wheel one, well one last time? I was one of the last ones to sew her thermal barriers in. And I said, I want a picture to show my grandchildren, because we didn't have a lot of pictures. They didn't allow photography a lot in the areas where we worked. So I said, program's winding down. Can I at least get this? So that's me pointing out my bright pink stitches. So again, I tell my granddaughters, no, grandma doesn't have a degree, but grandma was an artist. But I tell them, don't ever look down on anybody who worked for a living and worked with their hands because we were artists and we were craftspeople. And I said, and Grandma did a very important job. And I said, you don't know how the passion Grandma had when I would be crawling up into her belly because that was her heart. And I helped bring them home. So, sorry. So anyway, in this picture, I proudly tell my granddaughters, you know what? Grandma's got stitches in the Smithsonian, and how many grandmas can ever tell their grandkids that? <laughs> so, and here, so a lot of questions I get asked, and I'm going to answer anybody. People ask us all the time about what's next out there. They think now that we're not doing shuttle, we're not doing anything, and nothing could be further from the truth. We had our Orion launch, which was one of the rockets. It's a heavy lift one. Uh, 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 shuttle was low Earth orbit. This will be moon and beyond. We had our first launch of that rocket just December 5th. And so we've had to redo the pads, and we're constantly redoing both the pads. Um, in fact, pad A still looks like a shuttle one, but SpaceX has taken over. We've had a lot of civilian companies compete to work, uh, work with NASA. NASA's given some seed money, but SpaceX has been the most successful um, civilian program. It's part of the commercial crew program. They've sent six flights to the International Space Station with over 5,000 pounds of food and, and experiments. So of all the civilian companies, they've been the most successful. But pad B is another story. They've stripped it all. It doesn't even look at all like the pad anymore because we consider that a clean pad. So any of the new companies that want to develop rockets, they can be launching off of pad B, but it's so sad when you drive by because it doesn't even look like a shuttle pad anymore. And so then we have the space station. We all know about that. Um, it's as long as a football field if you're not familiar with how big, and there's over 16 nations that were involved in building it. Um, in fact, um, this surprises a lot of people. I do get a few grumblings about um, our cooperation with the Russians, but a lot of people aren't aware. When we first developed shuttle, we didn't have a space station to practice docking techniques. It was the mirror uh, their mirror space station is how we practiced over 14 flights we sent to their space station so we could practice docking techniques. In fact, the docking port that we have on all of the shuttles, not Columbia, but the rest of them, were all Russian designed because we figured hey, that's what we practice on, and so it's a Russian design that we have. Uh, we also have, um, the, another question we get asked is there's Canada written on the arms of both of um, the shuttles because Canada made the arms for us. That's probably our second most asked question out there. The first one sadly being, is that, our, uh, is that shuttle real? Because we get asked that every single day, and the reason why I think they think it looks that way 
we, 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 we get told all the time, it looks like a science fair project gone bad, because when they look at the blankets and they see the different areas of white, some of it does look like paper mache, and they honestly think the shuttle's fake that we have on board. But Canada made the arms for us. We flew three other Canadian astronauts to the space station, and instead of paying us to send their astronauts to space, they developed and, and uh, made the arms for us and saved us millions of dollars in research and development. So this is SpaceX, that's the Dragon. Again, six, six times successfully to the space station. Orbital Service Science, excuse me, is another company that's going with NASA to compete with. Here we go. This is what a Dragon capsule looks like. And I actually have in my photo album on the table the very first Dragon that docked at the space, uh, at the space station. It's all gray and dirty looking, but I have a real photograph in my album. So um, this is Boeing's, uh, uh, their uh, version of their rocket that they want to do. And that's what the new Orion rocket will look like. We're using, it might look familiar to you, right here, we're using shuttle segments. And we've also used some of the shuttle engines that we didn't use. We recycled them to our new rocket for Orion. Here we go, and we have that, and that's it. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> Now's the time. Thank you. Anybody have any questions about anything? Um, NOMAX and a lot of these other materials, were they developed by NASA or did they exist from other uses? That's a good question. It's about half and half. A lot of our, oh, you're right. I'm sorry, can, can I, I, she wanted to know were the special fabrics that we use, were they developed by NASA, spe, by NASA specifically? Yeah. Okay, some of our fabrics were. Uh, the first company that comes to mind, and it's still in business now, which makes me smile, there was an insulation company called John, John Mansfield, and they're still, they're still, they made some of our initials, some of our fabrics for us. In fact, if you're wondering how we even tested the blankets, we actually um, had the, the, the fabric and then we um, took blanket samples and made them and actually flew the fabric outside of F-15 jets off the coast of California so we could test how they would stay uh, with wind. And plus we also tested the blankets in wind tunnels in uh, Langley, Virginia, uh, and so we could see how well the fabric would do. Any other questions? Sure. Joe Kennedy jumped from space in 1960, and I'm Dave from a helium balloon. Uh, what who would have made all of his spacesuit to do this, since he was at a really high altitude? Oh gosh. Oh man, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know that one. I know we had a lot of test divisions for NASA, so he may have... He was the U.S. Air Force. That's, and we had a lot of our astronauts being, so he probably, NASA probably had some, some, some sort of development with that. I'll have to look that up. I have my business card. I hope, I don't know if I put them in my bag or not. Um, but um, if you give me an email address, I'll do, um, I think I have my cards in my purple bag. Oh, all right, we'll have to check that. I'm sorry, I don't know for sure. I was five when that happened. <laughs> I, you know, stand up, stand up. I gotta, this is Don Tallman, and most of you know, Don graduated with me at Carmen High School in Flint, Michigan in 1973, and I saw him for the first time after 42 years yesterday. We hadn't seen each other since we graduated from high school. <laughs> Now this will make, of that, he wants to know how difficult it was depending on the thickness or how hard it was to sew through. Surprisingly, it wasn't that bad. Um, when we finished off the blanket um, and even the thermal barriers, we always used a curved needle and everybody thinks we had some sort of NASA developed needle. Well, um, sounds like I'm bashing men, but I don't mean to. The NASA engineers would give us needles that had a square hole which is not good because it would leave too big of a hole when we would stitch and of course therma, uh, with thermal protection you want a sm small, you know, want very small holes. So we would go to Joanne Fabrics and we went to the upholstery department <laughs> and we bought curved needles because they had a curved hole. Now that high temperature thread that you'll see after this, it frays badly. 
So the friction even of square hole would just tear that thread apart, which is why we knew if we put it through an oval hole. But really it wasn't that bad to sew through, but it had to be the needle. I always went with a two inch, some of the girls went with a big one. But again, we couldn't pull the needle and thread through at the same time. Um, we, we would pull the needle and thread once, and then if we, instead of pulling the needle and thread together every stitch, after we got the thread and the needle through the fabric, then we would just pull on the tail because that constant friction through the um, hole would just make the thread frayed to nothing. And our call out as we were stitching the thermal barriers in was 12 stitches per inch plus or minus an inch, which I used to go, yeah, right, because I was lucky if I got 12 stitches in as we were stitching them in because by the 12th stitch it would already start to fray out, which meant we would have to stop, knot it, and bury that knot. So that's why it took the 17 hours. That thread frays badly, and it's meant for the sewing machine, but because it frayed so much, we thought we had a consistent part if we sewed them by hand. But it wasn't so bad, it was just the tools, and, and people would say, you had to buy your own tools, and we said, yeah, but that was, our, that was our number on that part, and we wanted a good part. My number was 3281, and it was a sad day, because three weeks before the program ended, we have to sign that we're responsible for our part number. So every time we did a, uh, a step of a part, we had to stamp each section, and then quality would come and buy the part after what we did. So three weeks before the program ended, we had to turn in our stamps. And I think that's when it really hit us that the program was going to go away because we had to turn in our, 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 our part stamp. And then we knew once that was gone, we knew we wouldn't be making parts anymore. Any other questions? Sure. Well, I, ideally, anybody who does a type of needlework, they say 18 inches. <laughs> we tried with 18 inches, but really, like I said, I'd be lucky if I could maybe sew with that much when it would really start to fray. That's the one thing when you work with high temperature things, like the reinforced carbon carbon on the leading out of the wing, it can withstand over 3,100 degrees, but it's very fragile to get hit. Our high temperature thread, it's pretty strong for heat, but they fray out so it's crazy how badly they fray. We here. Have time for maybe two more oh, then these two right here. <laughs> okay. Here. Well, that's a good question. Obviously, Russia must have their own team because they have a space team. Now, um, of course. Uh, all the thermal work was done in Palmdale, California, because that's where all the shuttles were built in California. So they would make the tile over there, and when Columbia came here uh, to Kennedy Space Center, the turnaround time for tile were almost a week, and they're thinking, this is insane. <laughs> they make the stuff over here, and yet we're installing it here. So starting in 1988, they closed the facilities in Palmdale, and all of that was moved over to Kennedy Space Center. So the thermal protection facility that I worked in started in 1988, and that's when we started making tile and all the blankets and everything else for the shuttle. In fact, it's really neat where we work, because right across the street, we have three processing facilities called um, OPFs, orbital processing facilities. Two were across the street, one and two was right across the street. Three was just to the right of our building and the VAB was kitty corner. So we were right in the middle of everything. We got to see all sorts of stuff. The crawler would crawl down the side of our building and we could walk up like four feet away from it and it was always coming by because the parking garage for the crawlers were right behind our building. We could always tell when we were getting ready to go because diesel engines on theirs and it would like smoke out our place and, and we'd get headaches. And that's an interesting stat. People want to know, the crawlers are huge, and they only move a mile an hour, and they only, it takes, they only move 42 feet per gallon with the fuel, the diesel fuel that we use. And so we recently redid them to get ready for the Orion program. They used to carry 12 million pounds, which sounds like a lot, and it is, but we've redone both the crawlers. They're Hans and Franz, is their names is what we called them, and that, that, everything's got a name out there. That's been their name since they started in the 60s. We now have the capability of carrying 18 million pounds since we've redone them to carry our new heavy lift Orion rocket. And, and you, I guess, will be the last one. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. What would you like, hon? Where was the fabric, fabric used on the tile? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. 
um, Apollo spacesuits for one. Oh, I'm sorry. He wanted to know where the fabric was used on Apollo. Well, the spacesuits too. Now, I don't know if you had a chance to see my table of my Chotskys, as all my friends call them, of my shuttle parts, they call them Chotskys. Um, but I do have blankets in there, and specifically you'll see a silver blanket, and a sil you'll see a gold one. Now, I want to talk about the gold blanket in particular. And I can't stress enough, you don't know how lucky you guys are to see a gold blanket. Now maybe it's no big deal to you, but truly if you knew the history behind it, you'll be really impressed that you've got a chance to see one. Our first blankets that we made, they're called thermal controlled blankets or TCS blankets, and they're actually in the walls of the shuttle, all 5,400 of them that you never see. <laughs> uh, we made a bunch of those. Um, as the shuttles would go through modifications and be updated, we would get racks and racks of gold blankets. And we would smile because we knew those were the very original shuttle blankets that were made for the shuttle. Gold, because when we first made the blankets for the shuttle, 24 karat gold, it was a 10% blend that we made in those blankets, even the layers are gold. Two reasons why we used gold. It's naturally anti-corrosive and the orbiters being made near the ocean, we needed that, it was important. But um, gold's also a good mater material for radiation protection, and that's why we have those blankets so a little bit for thermal protection, but primarily for radiation protection. And as we have right now, we have nothing in our arsenal to go to Mars for any type of radiation protection. So it's been said probably a one-way trip, because depending on where Mars is, six to nine months there, six months on the planet, six to nine months back, and right now we don't have any method of radiation protection for the crew to last that long. Any other, one, one more? Oh, all right, well, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm.